Amen. Thank you, Brother Heminger. Brother Heminger is a great personal blessing to me. Uh, every, every sermon that I have preached, uh, as I'm driving home, I always get a text from Brother Heminger. Always. And it's, I, I love you, preacher. That spoke to my heart. Great message. Or something of that caliber after every single message. And I just appreciate his spirit. Great singer. Great family. Praise God for him. James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verse 14. James chapter 4, verse 14. Here's what the Bible says. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Now that kind of gives us the idea that life is short. Over in 1 Samuel chapter 20 and verse 3, here's what the Bible says. It says, there is but a step between me and death. So how far is death away? Just a step. Just a step. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, my son, forget not my law. I read this for you just a few minutes ago. But let thine uh, heart keep my commandments. For length of days and long life and peace shall they add to thee. So the Bible here, I believe, is helping us to understand the brevity of life. You know, life can be very short. Uh, probably some of the saddest funerals I've ever preached in my life has been the funerals of babies. Just very sad. Little caskets, very small, placed into the ground. Very, very sad. Uh, probably uh, some of the most glorious sermons of uh, funerals I've ever preached is somebody has lived a righteous life, somebody might save, somebody might lives a righteous life, and they live into old age. There's just something about somebody serving God all the days of their life without taking a misstep, and then they finish out well. There's just something about that. Uh, you know, I think it's something we all ought to try and shoot for, but there's something about that. Another, another type of uh, a funeral, I'm not trying to depress you here, but uh, another type of funeral is somebody that maybe didn't start well. Uh, you're going to go home tonight and say, uh, somebody's going to say, man, was it good in church? Yeah, pastor preached on funerals and death. It was I was really encouraged. But uh, another one is somebody that maybe didn't start well, but somewhere in their life they got saved. Somewhere in their life they uh, received Christ, and then they turned uh, a 180 around, started going the other way. That was my older brother. I witnessed to my older brother over and over and over again. My brother refused to receive Christ. But then there was a day when all of a sudden the light bulb came on. And Dave said, I need Christ. Now, I think it took cancer to wake him up. But God gave him cancer. And I thank the Lord that that's what God used to wake him up. And Dave all of a sudden got saved. Dave made, and I'm telling you, he made a 180 degree turn. Uh, for anybody that would have knew Dave, you would have thought that was one of the meanest guys that ever lived. I mean, you know, if you were burning, he didn't like you. He wouldn't even spit on you. I mean, just mean, just a junkyard dog mean. And he could be that way. He could be that way. But then uh, after he got saved, testimony of his children. Wow, did he become sweet. I mean, man, he just loved people, uh, loved uh, caring about people, and uh, loved giving people the gospel. I mean, he became somebody, if you will, that uh, would pass out gospel tracts everywhere he went. He got these signs. You know, you see these bumper stickers that people have, and you think, man, that guy's just, uh, you know, he's ballistic. He's crazy, you know. He, he'd have all over the back of his vehicle, repent or burn, you know, stuff like that. You know, uh, I had bumper stickers with uh, people dying, you know, being cast into hell, stuff like that. You know, and, 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 but man, he'd pass out tracts, he'd give his testimony. I mean, he just wanted people to be saved. You know, uh, as far as a pastor, when you see somebody that ends well, maybe they didn't have a good life, but Christ saved them, and they ended well. Can I tell you, that's a great, great testimony. That's what we call a trophy of grace. Right there, okay? But now, for you and I, here we are tonight, Parkside Baptist Church members. What about starting life over? I think everybody needs a new start. You know, sometimes you have to put a new battery in a vehicle, and it starts. Uh, sometimes we need a jolt, and it starts. 
okay? And so what about starting life over? Uh, what about, if you would please, saying, okay, here's why I'm at in my life. I'm not satisfied with the way I'm serving Christ. I'm not satisfied with the way I'm living for God. I'm not satisfied with my Bible reading. I'm not satisfied with my prayer life. I'm not satisfied with my soul winning endeavors. I'm not satisfied with my lack of being faithful to the house of God. I'm not satisfied with my marriage relationship. I'm not satisfied with my child rearing endeavors. I'm not satisfied with the way that I'm a testimony in front of my friends or maybe uh, in front of those that's in a lost and dying world. You know, I'm just not satisfied. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do if you feel like that everything up to now has been a failure? What do you do? What do you do if you feel like, man, I tell you what, I've tried and I've failed. I tried and I failed. No reason to try again. What do you do? Where do you go from there? Uh, what do you do on the days that just don't go well? I mean, you try to live for God, you come home, you try and be a testimony in front of your parents, and all of a sudden they curse you out, you know, uh, they belittle you. What do you do with something like that? What do you do when you try to live a bright testimony? I'm talking about being separated from the world. I'm talking about trying to live for God. You're really trying to do what's right, and your best friend is not doing that. What do you do? What do you do when it seems like you're at the workplace and it seems like that nobody cares? And here you are, you're praying for your meals, you're passing out Bible tracts, Bible literature, you're trying to be a gospel witness, and it seems like everywhere you turn on that certain day, everybody's saying a curse word, everybody's trying to tell a dirty joke, no matter where you are, the music is horrendously whirly and bad. What do you do? How do you make it? How do you make it? What do you do when you're driving in Dallas traffic and everybody cuts you off? How do you respond to that? And most of them are in their 90s. How do you respond to that? What do you do? Let me give you a couple of things. How is it that you can start over, now listen to the word, again, again. What can you do to start over, listen to the word, again, again. You're going to find out in your life that if you don't start over again and again and again and again, you're going to wind up being a castaway and do nothing for Jesus Christ. All right, so what do you do? Let me give you a couple of thoughts tonight. Statement number one, uh, start living the crucified life. Start living the crucified life. You know what I'm finding out in the day in which we live? I was talking to a pastor at uh, Brother Bobby's funeral there in Walkertown, and he said this. He said, living for Christ today and pastoring a church today is harder than it was 20 years ago. Because today, everybody has hooks in them. I mean, you got the media has a hook in you. you got the internet has a hook in you. Uh, today's worldliness is more worldly than it was 20 years ago. Check it out. Uh, today's evil is more evil than it was 20 years ago. Brother Smith, good to see you. God bless you. All right? Uh, you know, uh, today it's harder to live for God. Why? Because you have all these things that's coming after you. All these things are trying to get you not to do right. All these things are trying to get you to go the wrong way. Uh, the movies today are dirtier right. than they've ever been right, right. in the history of the United States. Yeah. The talk today on the streets is more filthy than it's ever been in my lifetime. The jokes that I'm hearing today by Christians. Today, here's what you got. You got young people who come to church on Sunday, go get drunk on Monday, and think nothing about it. There's no conviction. Why is that? Uh, why is it that somebody can uh, be in church, sing the songs of Zion, be happy about God, and uh, uh, open their Bible, know the books of the Bible, know where to open the Bible, listen attentively, and then they go out on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, live like the devil, trash God, trash the testimony of Christ, and it just seems like it's a game. Why? Why is it today that Christians are pretend? Where is the real ones? How is it that we can start all over again? Let me give you, again, a couple of thoughts. I said statement number one, 
uh, living the crucified life. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20, he says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. All right, so what do I do? I get up and I realize just like Paul, I realize I've got to crucify the flesh. I'm going to tell you something. Your flesh is alive and well. You've got to decide that you're going to get up. Uh, You say, I don't want to get up and read the Bible. Make yourself. I don't want to go to church. Make yourself. Self. You make yourself exercise, you make yourself take vitamins, you make yourself uh, be able to make money. Why can't you make yourself be spiritual? You will never do anything for God. Somebody says, well, I can do it for God all by myself. I don't need church. I'll just do what I want to do. You're a fool. You're a fool. You'll never make it. By the way, you ought to have a desire to marry right. You ought to have a desire to rear your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You ought to have your desire to be in an independent Baptist church, not some Southern Baptist liberal church. You ought to have a desire. You say, well, the independent Baptist churches, uh, they're just too strict. Hey, in a loose world, you need some strictness. In a loose world, you need somebody that's going to get up and say, hey, drugs are bad. They're going to destroy you. They're going to hurt you. They're going to ruin your life. They're going to destroy your family. Hey, you need somebody in the pulpit that's going to cry aloud, spare not, not be ashamed of it, raise their voice like a trumpet. Hey, you need preachers nowadays in the pulpit to say homosexuality and the practice thereof is sin. It's wrong. You need somebody that's going to stand up in the pulpit and simply say, listen, if you were born a man, stay a man. If you were born a woman, stay a woman. This thing about, well, I'm confused about my, my, my gender. Said it right. I'm confused about my gender. Not my ginger. Oh, we're not confused about that. But uh, I'm confused about my gender. Hey, can I tell you? Uh, listen, if you were born a boy, you are a boy. Man, we got guys that are walking around saying, well, uh, maybe I'm a girl. Somebody needs to kick you. By the way, let me help you out a little bit. Stand up. When you shake hands, you shake hands like a man. And you don't go up to somebody and say, how do you do? You don't do that. Then you grab that hand like a man, put that, force that, force that. For, to the man. Force to that the man. thing in there. Yeah, now don't do it to a lady. You go up to a lady and you go, mm, she's going to fall back that away. But learn to be masculine. Yeah. Man, you see these guys, they walk with a wiggle. Forget it. Yeah. Forget the wiggle out of you. Go play football. Yeah. Get out there and box and let somebody beat your brains out. I'm saying this, listen, the crucified life. Hey, if you would simply just decide God is right and man is wrong. And by the way, God is right. And by the way, man is wrong. And it doesn't matter what our society thinks. God was right long before there was an America. God will be right long after America is gone. I'm saying statement number one, living the crucified life. We have people that get their feelings hurt. Well, I can't believe you said that. That hurt my feelings. And you know what I'm going to say about that. Get over it. Stop wearing your feelings out there like somebody that's uh, feminine and emotionally led. Get it. Just get over it. Grow up. Be somebody that uh, takes rebuke as a man. Be somebody that lives for God. Be somebody that steps out, does what you're supposed to do. How do you do it, preacher? Crucified life. What else can you do to be able to start over again? Statement number two. I said statement number one, uh, living the crucified life. Statement number two, looking for the right way. Now, by the way, you can find the wrong way everywhere. But if you want to find the right way, you have to look for it. You know how many churches are in the Dallas metro? Scores. You know how many churches uh, are uh, 
fundamental, independent, premillennial, hellfire, brimstone, soul eating, separated Baptist churches? Few. You know how many of those churches are preaching truth and standing for righteousness and not giving a rip? Fewer. You know how many of those churches run buses and are soul winning? Fewer. Hey, I'm telling you something tonight. You ought to thank God tonight that you're a member of Parkside Baptist Church. We might not have the perfect church, but I can tell you it's a far cry from uh, the other type of messes that's out there. You ought to thank God tonight that you can be a member of a church. Hey, where I'm talking about, we have right singing and we have right dress, I said dress standards. I, I'm talking about, we expect our young people to do right. I'm saying we preach from that King James Bible and only from that Bible and we don't apologize for it. You say, well, I'll tell you what, when I grow up, I'm leaving here. Where are you going, Bubba? Where are you going to go? Well, I'm just going to go uh, join some liberal outfit. If that's what you're thinking, you'll probably go. Uh, you know how many young people that's broken my heart over the years? I've only been here eight years. Hello? But I see them, they're on Instagram and they're on Twitter. And they're going to churches that look like rock concerts. Dark lights. Guys and gals singing, performing, if you will. That, that was performing. Man, you don't want to raise your kids in that junk. They can get that at the bar. I'm saying this. I'm saying looking for the right way. You have to look for it. Well, how do you do it? Well, you have to look at yourself first and reveal who you are. Over in 2 John chapter 1 and verse 8, the Bible says, Look to yourselves. That you lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we have received, it says, but that we receive a full reward. He said, look, man, you know what's right. Don't lose it. Don't lose it. By the way, if it was right 20 years ago from the Bible, it's going to be right today. If it was right 50 years ago from the Bible, it's going to be right today. Just because society changes does not mean that the church ought to change. Amen. Somebody gave a scenario many years ago. They said this. They said, well, as the world changes, the church is only about 10 years behind. So as the world moves this way, so does the church. They just move a little bit slower. It ought not be that way. You know, our church is known can I tell you? For hymn books. People come to visit our church. You do what? Well, I haven't opened it. I hear this all the time. I haven't opened a hymn book in 10 years. Here's what they say. I didn't know churches still used them. Well, I think it's good we have a hymn book. I think it's good you can open it and see the words. Amen. Amen. You know what else I hear about our church? I didn't know people were still dressed up for church. Amen. In my day, you dressed up for what was important to you. Amen. Take Mrs. Wells out to a nice restaurant. What am I going to do? I'm going to dress up. Or I'm going to feel out of place. You know, can I tell you, when you come to a church like this, and man, people love God enough to dress up, and they dress their very best, that doesn't speak uh, evil of them. That's not negative of them. That's not something that's wrong about them. That is something that is just great. Because it shows who's important to you. So you have to look for the right way. Hey, this will help. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 says, Looking on to Jesus, who's the author and finisher of our faith, says, Who for the joy uh, that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and set down at the right hand, it says, of the throne of God. So what do I do? I look for Jesus. Uh, he's in it. Let God be God. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse and By the way, it's a compliment to me. Mm. It's a compliment to me when somebody that lives a worldly lifestyle says, man, I tell you what, your preaching is too strong. <laughs> now, when somebody comes to me and they're living for God, they're serving God, and they say, man, I like that preaching. Now, who do you think that's going to make a bigger impression on me? 
Oh, you say, preacher, if you keep preaching this way, you'll never have 1,000 people. Well, that's what they said a while back, and they said you'd never have 500. Now we've way surpassed that. It's not a matter. Can I tell you, parents want somebody that's going to be behind the pulpit and say, look, wake up. Wake up. We don't want you to do drugs. We want you to live for God. You can't raise a Christian family today. Wake up. Somebody's got to be the one. You said, a preacher, it's going to get you in trouble. I'm going to be more in trouble with God if I don't do what God says and preaching the book. I'm saying this. I'm saying that uh, listen, statement number next, to the right things. Listen to the right things. By the way, let's go back. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 3, where it talks about looking the right way. It says, uh, for consider him that endured, it says, uh, such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. So when you get discouraged and say, I just can't do it, you look to Jesus. Consider him. Then you won't be weak in your minds anymore. So how is it that I can start life over again? Living the crucified life, looking the right way, listening to the right things. You get around somebody and start talking about, hey man, let's go out there and shoot up. Wrong thing to listen to. Get around somebody and they say, hey, let's go down and visit the bar. Wrong thing to listen to. Somebody says, well, I see nothing wrong with addressing it modestly. It would draw more guys. Wrong thing to listen to. Well, I think you ought to disobey your parents. Your parents will never find out. We can just do it behind their back. Wrong thing to listen to. Well, let's skip church and stay home and watch the ball game. Wrong thing to listen to. Well, I tell you what. Hey, I don't believe that that preacher has a right to do what he does as he steps on my toes all the time and sits in my lap and spits in my right eyeball. I just don't think that that is right. Wrong thing to listen to. I'm set, and by the way, the critics that uh, criticizes a man of God, they don't do very much. Have you ever figured that out? You know, the people that left here right, I'm talking about ones that did leave the church, and boy, was I brokenhearted over that. It's for some of you showed up. Man, I'd walk that field in the back, and I'd just weep and cry over them. Then it hit me one day. If they're leaving right, they'll stay right. But if they're leaving wrong... They'll stay wrong until they get right. Can I tell you how many left here with a wrong heart? They don't even faithfully attend church now. Shows who they are. We have some that left here, went to one church. They're bouncing around. They're like a bouncing ball. They can't figure out where to sit down. Shows who they are. Now, can I tell you, thank God for those old parksiders. Uh, No, you're not old, but I mean, you were here. (laughs) Some of you were young. But you stayed. Well, you know what I hear about some that left? Here's what I hear. The reason they left was not because of doctrine, was because your personality was different than Dr. May, when Dr. May warned them of that. Nod your head. Is it right, Doc? Yeah. (laughs) Miss Magnus waving her hand right there. Uh, she has a, a Pentecostal background. Okay. I think some of you ladies ought to get a hanky from time to time and wave it. Yeah, I think that'd be a good thing. Make sure it's clean. Mark chapter 4 and verse 24, the Bible says, and he said unto them, says, take heed what ye hear. So what's he saying? He said, look, make sure you listen to the right things. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 5, the Bible says, A wise man will hear and will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall, it says, attend unto wise counsels. So a wise man hears. By the way, the Bible talks about in the book of Proverbs that a wise man will, when you rebuke him, he'll love you. You rebuke, you rebuke a scorner, that's somebody that's a critic, and he'll hate you. So depending on how they respond, you know if they're wise or you know if they're a critic. Sure. All right. Now, I'm saying this. Here's what I'm saying. You listen to the right things. 
By the way, remember Pharaoh? Michael often and I was talking about Pharaoh a little bit this morning after the service. And I told Mike, I said, you remember Pharaoh? Pharaoh hardened his heart. Remember that? Hardened his heart. Stay with me. Stay with my thought. Hardened his heart. Then there came a time when God said, okay, my turn, and God hardened his heart. I've seen people harden their heart about tithing. They say, I'm not going to give God the money through the local church. By the way, local church is where you have membership. I'm not going to give my money through the local church, and uh, I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And they say, no, 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 no. And then all of a sudden, God says, okay, I'm done with you in that area. And so he closes them down. Then they get no financial blessing, and things in their life begin to fall apart. I've seen people do that about church. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go. Then all of a sudden, God says, okay, you said that enough. And so, therefore, when a message is preached on it, I'm going to shut you down. You'll never be convicted about that again. As a man soweth that, shall he also reap. I've seen people that become critics, become critics, become critics. Here's what happens. All of a sudden, uh, they criticize, they criticize, they criticize, they criticize, they criticize. And God said, that's enough. Had enough of that. I'm just going to shut you down. And I've just seen it over and over and over again. I've seen people say, I'm not going to go soul winning. I'm not. I don't care about Jesus Christ. I'm not going to pass out a gospel tract. They say stuff like this. This is just not for me. So they never even pass out a gospel tract. Then after a while, God just shuts them down. I've, you're quiet, but I've seen it over and over and over again. Uh, I'm saying this, and then they lose the blessing. Uh, so you listen to the right thing. I said, how is it that you and I can start life over again? I'm going to hasten to a close here. Uh, uh, you uh, live the crucified life. You look for the right way. You listen to the right things. You ready? Uh, you have lips that speak seasoned words. And what's that mean? That means you think about them before you say them. Now, by the way, some of you should not speak as much as you do. Because you say and then you think. And it gets you in trouble. Maybe what you ought to do is think before you say. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 7. The Bible says, the fool's mouth is his destruction. But the lips, it says, uh, it says, and his lips, it says, are the snare of his soul. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 8. The Bible says, the words of a tale bearer are his wounds. They go down deep into the uttermost parts of the belly. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 23, the Bible says, a man that hath joy by answer of his mouth, a, wordly, uh, uh, a word spoken in due season. Listen to it now. It says, how good is it? Uh, the Bible says in Psalm 119 verse 72, it says, the law, it says, uh, of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. All right, so wait a minute. So God says, hey, listen, use your lips to speak seasoned words. Last one, here it is, and that is this. Uh, learn his ways. Isn't it neat in your Bible? Here's what the Bible says. You ready? Here it is. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, cease to do evil. Now, what's that? That's an abrupt halt. That's a stop. I'm going to stop drinking. It's done. I'm going to stop smoking. It's done. It's an abrupt hope. Cease to do evil. I'm going to stop looking at porno. I'm going to stop stealing God's money. I'm going to stop living for the devil. I'm going to stop thinking evil thoughts. I'm going to stop talking negative about my parents. I'm going to stop disobeying. A person stops evil abruptly. It's like you're putting on the brakes. It's done. I've stopped. I remember when I was in high school, first got saved. Had a guy, I ran track and field. Now, before I got saved, I'm telling you what happened before. I don't always go into stuff like this, but my dad was, my dad drank. And uh, he, he had trouble with liquor. And uh, oftentimes I would... I'm almost ashamed to say it, but I'm going to say it. I do the I do the the high jump, you know, where you would do the uh, Flosbury flop or whatever, and that's what I did the the method. 
So I would run and I would do that Flosbury flop and throw my back over, high jump and track and field. I was pretty good at it. I mean, I could, I could get up to seven feet or so. And so, I mean, I, I was pretty good at it. Had good spring in my, my calf muscles and so I, I was pretty good at it. And uh, somebody said amen. <laughs> just say that about the jump or the calf muscles? <laughs> the jump, okay, just making sure. So, man, I'd run up, do that Fosbury flop, go over it. And most of the time, I'd bet. Uh, and, you know, I'm just telling you how it was. So I'd bet on a keg of beer. My dad liked beer. So I'd, I'd bet on all the guys on the track team, I can out jump you today, and I'm going to bet I'm going to win the keg of beer. Oftentimes, more than not, I'd take a keg of beer to my dad. And I give it to my dad. My dad was so happy. But I remember when I got saved. Went to my dad and I said, Dad, I can't jump for beer anymore. He said, Why? You always bring me beer. I said, Dad, I got saved. He said, No, you got religion. He said, You're joining a cult. They poisoned your mind. I said, Think about it whatever you want to. I didn't know how to explain it. I just didn't. I said, No, I got saved. I mean, I truly, I know I'm going to go to heaven. Jesus lives with it. He said, I don't believe that. He said, you just don't want to do it no more because you don't love me. I said, Dad, no, no, I just, I can't. Uh, it's not right to do. I've been reading and learning from uh, the Bible. It's just not the right thing to do. I can't do it no more. He said, next thing you're going to tell me is you can't go down to the White House. Now, not in Washington, D.C. <laughs> A bar on Maple Grove Road. Yeah. It's called the White House. He said, next thing you're going to tell me is you can't go down the White House and pick up my liquor. I said, yeah, that's the other thing I want to talk to you about. <laughs> I can't go in the bar anymore. Right. Just doesn't look right for a Christian to walk into a bar, right. come out with uh, uh, the smokes that he smoked. I forget what it was. And uh, it doesn't look right. It doesn't look right for me to come out carrying liquor. It just it doesn't look right. Dad, I, I've got to stop that too. He said, no, 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 no. He said, you got something in your heart against me. And I want to know what it is, and you be man enough to tell me. I said, I will, I will. In my heart, I love you so much, I don't want you to burn and go to hell. He said, that has nothing to do with picking up liquor. He said, if I want to die and burn in hell, that's my business. I said, Dad, if you drink liquor, you'll fry more. I didn't know what to tell him. <laughs> he said, you're ridiculous. Get out of my face. I remember that. But later on, those little stances that I took, my dad remembered. And my dad later on, he called it religion. He wanted the same religion that I had. Amen. And he had a friend that led him to Christ. I wasn't there. I, was, I, I think I was in, I don't know where I was, Bible college somewhere. I was somewhere. Dad got saved. Now, can I say this? Uh, learn the right ways and then walk in them. Learn the right ways. I, I used to, before I got saved, before I got saved, I'm prefacing this, you understand? Before I got saved, I used to be heavy into rock music. This is back when they had eight tracks. Yeah. 1970s. Yeah. I remember getting saved, and I plugged in one of those eight tracks. I started listening to rock music, and somewhere deep down inside, I couldn't understand it. I couldn't explain it. Never read a verse on it, did not know my Bible at all. I just felt dirty. I started hearing the curse words. I started hearing about rebelling on mom and dad, and I thought, why do I want to listen to something that's not right? doesn't make any sense. It doesn't connect. If I don't want to be doing that, why listen to something that's going to promote that? I mean, there is some intelligence. So I said, okay, I'm, I'm not going to do it. So I, I, I took all my eight tracks out. We had these metal trash cans. I put all my eight tracks in there. Got the sledgehammer, went out. My brother came out and said, what are you doing? I said, uh, I, I'm getting rid of it. No, don't. Give them to me. I said, no, no, no. And I need to get rid of it. He said, you're crazy. Those things cost money. I said, yeah, I know. But they're ruining me. He said, let them ruin me. 
I said, no, no, I don't want them to ruin you either. He said, I'll buy them from you. I'll pay you 50% of their worth. And I said, well, no, no, that's not right. Either. I took that sledgehammer and I started pounding that music. Amen. But what I, I, I felt clean. Amen. There's something about laying your head on your pillow at night yeah. when you know you've done right. Amen. And there's that clean feeling that comes through. I felt actually free. Yes, now, by the way, you might be watching things on your uh, flat screen that you shouldn't be watching right now. Amen. Might be time you need to clean house. Amen. You might be having some DVDs or you might be having some uh, 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 CRD or whatever. You might be having, yeah, those things. Digital, record, whatever. You know, there's something about when you have that trash inside of you that it doesn't keep you clean. So what do you do? Listen to the right things. Speak seasoned words. Here it is. Learn his right ways. Here it is. Over in Psalm, I'm done, three verses, I'm done. Psalm 119, verse 71. The Bible says, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, the psalmist says, that I might learn thy statues. He said, man, it's good that I go through hard times when I learn more about you. Hard times for the Christians are blessings. Why? It draws you closer to him. Carl Hatch, we traveled a little bit together and preached. When Brother Hatch, he was in Pensacola, Florida, car pulled out, hit him broadside, was a college student not paying attention, hit him broadside, carried him across the highway, uh, messed up his his shoulder, hand was all crippled up. But I watched after that accident, Carl Hatch changed. You know what happened? He became more compassionate. He cared about people more. He slowed down and helped people more than he ever did in his life. Curtis Hudson was always a great preacher. Just being honest with you, always a great preacher. He gets you laughing, 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 laughing. You think he's never going to get to the preaching. Laughing, then all of a sudden, he starts to preach and cut you to shreds. Great preacher. I want to tell you what. When cancer got a hold of his body, it changed him. He had more power of God all over him when going through the valley than he ever had while walking on the mountaintop. I'm saying this, learning his ways. Psalm 119, verse 73, the Bible says, Thy hands have made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn thy commandments. Verse 74, last verse I'll read. The Bible says, uh, They that fear thee will be glad when they see me because I have hoped in thy word. See, when you go through trials, if you're walking with God, makes you better, not bitter. Whenever you go through, I've watched this. I've watched this all the days of my life as a believer. I've watched this. People go through trials. They're either going to get better or they're going to get bitter. I've watched it all the days of my life. Those that get bitter is because their relationship and walking with God is not where it should be. Those that get better always have a relationship that is deep with God. Doesn't it say something like that a righteous man falleth seven times and riseth up again. Then the Bible talk about how you're supposed to rebound, and when you do rebound, when you walk with God, you rebound, if you will, please, with blessing. Yeah. I'm saying this. I'm saying that when we decide that we're going to uh, starting life over again, when you start life over again, over and over and over again, it's fresh every day. I'm just being honest with you. I look forward to Sunday mornings, but I look forward to Sunday nights, but I look forward to Mondays. I can't wait. Tomorrow, man, it's going to be great. I look forward to Tuesdays. I do. I look forward to Wednesdays. 
I, I, you know, I look forward to, hey, missions conference. I can't wait. I was telling my wife this afternoon, we're fellowshipping together. I said, honey, missions conference. Man, I can't wait. Man, we get to go to church on Wednesday and on Thursday and on Friday. We get to hear missionaries' hearts. Wow, we're going to have a different preacher there. And so the people, they're going to be so delighted they get to hear somebody else. And I can't wait. I'm going to get to sit in the chair and take notes. When Dr. Uh, uh, Bachman was here, Dr. James Bachman, when he was here, and then he was teaching about biblical forgiveness. Man, I wrote it down, wrote it down. I'm going to give it to a secretary this week. They're going to have to type it. But I wrote it down, wrote it down, wrote it down, wrote it down, wrote it down. I said, wonderful. That I'm going to use in counseling. That's good stuff. The things that you learn in church can change your life forever. So what do you do? Here's what you do. You say, well, I tell you what, when I come to church, it's not always good. When you take vitamins, you don't see the benefit of them always, but you just keep taking them. Well, tonight, I didn't get anything out of it. Oh, you got something, or you might not have put a finger on it, but you come to church, God's speaking to your heart, just giving you a little bit here and a little bit there is what you need to finish the journey. I attended that funeral, nine speakers. The funeral lasted for over three hours. Man, I sat there, and I'll be honest with you, I was just sitting there just waiting for the next speaker. Waiting for, there was a song in between each one, or a choir, or a quartet, or something. And man, I was just sitting there, and just, just listening, just taking it in, just learning, just growing. See, you can learn no matter where you go. You can let God help you no matter where you go. You can let God teach you. Oh, but preacher, not everybody's uh, enthusiastic. It doesn't matter. I've heard preachers get up. They never move from, oh, with well, Dr. Bachman. When he preached Wednesday night, stood right here. Stood right here. Whole time, stood right here. He didn't, go, he didn't stand on the front pew. He didn't walk to the second pew. He didn't try to spit on your head. Huh? Every preacher is different. They are. Here's what makes the difference in your life is that Bible truth. God begins to show, and, and, and if you listen real good, man, God's got some nuggets in there that would change your life forever. Closing testimony, I'm done. River Valley Ranch, very liberal today, non-denominational. Back in the day when I was coming up, had fundamental preachers, good, fundamental, solid men of God. Today, it's not worth spit. And so, but, uh, but, uh, and man, but back in the day, man, it was good. It was just, now you're going to look it up. But anyway, uh, <laughs> back in the day, you know, uh, I helped out as being a trail boss and take people around, you know, the horses and all that stuff. And uh, every Saturday night, they had a Christian film. I'd always go to it. Got saved. I was hungry for the truth. I uh, had the night off on Friday nights, and they always let outsiders come to their youth camp. So I'd go up every Friday. It's the only night I could. All the other nights I worked, or I, or I was at church. You know, Wednesday night, I was at my own church. Thursday night, I was going soul winning at my own church. But Friday nights, I had off. To, uh, Monday and Tuesday nights, I worked two jobs when I was going through high school. And so uh, I, I was working uh, those two jobs. You know, and so, so here I was. I had Fridays off. I, said, Man, I always went to preaching on Friday night. I was hungry for the Word of God. Never will forget Ryan Riley, uh, 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 an evangelist, got up. He preached a message, sold out Christians. I thought, that, I'm, I'm not there. I, I'm not there. I, I didn't even know what a sold out Christian was. I didn't know that things were wrong. I, had no, I, I didn't know. I didn't know. And so he preached, and man, I went forward, and I was praying, and I, I said, God, I, I want to be that. I want to be that. I want to be that sold-out Christian. That's what I want to be. I just want to be. I want you to use me, God. I don't know how, but please use me, God. And boy, I poured my heart out to God. In that same service that night, I never will forget, there was a teenage girl. Boy sat on one side of the tabernacle. Girl sat on the other side of the tabernacle. She's about my age, I guess. And she stood up, and he hit rock music that night. I mean, he knocked it out of the ballpark. And I'm sitting there like, wow, I didn't know it was that bad. 
I mean, he's just knocking it. And she stood up when he said, rock music is of the devil. She stood up and she said, you're a liar. Sit back down. She said her piece. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, man, you're stupid. Yeah. <laughs> and nobody was coming to get her. You know, uh, he said, man, you kids that's messing with drugs, you're going to wind up dead. She stood up again. She said, you're a liar. She sat back down. I thought, man, somebody needs to take that girl out. She stood up again. As he said something, I forget what it was, third time, but I, know, I remember there's two things. And, uh, and she, said, she said something, and all of a sudden two men came from the front, got her. She's screaming and hollering, about 16 years of age. Carried her physically out of the tabernacle. Said, you're out of the camp, you're gone. We don't want you in here. You're destroying the church services. Go home. She said, well, I need to go. And they wouldn't even let her go to the dormitory, get her stuff. Get out of here. Kicked her out of the camp. Should have. Kicked her out of the camp. On the way home, she's going home. She got in a car wreck. Got killed. I know her forget that. The whole time that she was standing up, she's saying, you're a liar inside of my heart. I said, man, you're telling the truth. I mean, I grew up in a home where my brother dealt drugs. I said, man, you're telling the truth. He'd hit liquor. You're telling the truth. I, my home is being destroyed by liquor. You're telling the truth. And I went forward that night, tears coming down my face. I said, God, I don't want that. I don't know what I need to do, but I give you myself. Man, I cried like a baby. 300 and some kids inside that big old tabernacle. I was the last, I didn't know. Everybody's leaving. I didn't know that. All I knew is my heart was full and I was so broken. And I stayed at that altar for a long time that night. Ryan Riley came up, I never will forget it. Put his arm around my shoulder and he said, you okay? I looked up, every, almost everybody's out of the tabernacle. Yeah, I really didn't care. I didn't feel stupid. I just felt like I needed to take care of business. And I didn't even know how to do that. I just knew I wanted to get close to God. Had some stuff in my life, shouldn't have been there. Man, I prayed, Brother Palmore, and I prayed. And he came down and put his kind arm around me. And, and then we sat over there on the, on the thingy. And uh, I told him, I said, you know, uh, I, I talked to my preacher, and I don't know anything about the Bible. This is all new stuff for me, and I want to learn the Bible. He suggests I go to Bible college, and he said, I just happen to be from a Bible college. I said, really? He named the Bible college. I said, wow, that's one that my pastor named. I said, this must be God. So I went and told my pastor. My pastor at that time was telling me, you need to pray and fast about it. You remember the story? And I said, this must be of God. So I went and told my pastor. He said, did God show you anything? I said, yeah, I need to go to this college. And I named it. He said, how do you know? I said, God revealed it to me. I didn't know nothing. So I went off to Bible college just because that just kind of coincided. And that's where I went. That's where I went. All right. Now, can I tell you? Listen, God wants to use you. Listen to me. I'm done. Listen to me. I'm done. God wants to use you. I don't care how old you are tonight. You can always start over again. Oh, I've sinned, preacher. I joined the sinner's club. We've all sinned. Well, preacher, I've messed up. We've all messed up. But preacher, I've done wrong. There's not a person in here who hadn't done wrong. And, and by the way, what's people going to think? Who cares what people think? You just decide you're going to serve God. Amen. And God will use you. Father, bless, we pray.